So we're starting today a, a series on marriage. And I have, and my wife and I talked about this, I'm so aware that I'm married. And I have no... Uh, yeah. I want you to believe because it's true. I want you to believe because it's true that what we're going to talk about is meaningful for anyone in any stage of life, and here's why. Because you are, you might consider marriage one day, you might be married today, you might have been married, you might have parents who are suffering in poor marriages or friends that are suffering in poor marriages. And what I hope to do, with the help of God, is over the next six weeks, make all of us have a more worshipful, healthy understanding of God's intent for humanity within this thing that we marriage that God has called marriage uh, it is a mistake to imagine it's a sin I think to imagine that married people have more potential to be blessed than single people and, and well intending people have said before things that contradict what I just said well intending people have said before that marriage is like the ultimate and it's not salvation is the ultimate and so um for those of us in the room who are single, for those of you who are single, this is meaningful because it's in Scripture. Because we live in a world where marriage is very, very common. <clears throat> Can you make it where it's just the whole screen? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Lowry. <laughs> Would you need to download the? Uh, the you are Do the best you can. Do. I'm good. No, you keep going. Keep going. Go. You're good. All right. Second, some of you. Um. I, this is so hard for me to say in a way that doesn't feel. <clears throat> Some of you have difficult marriages. Some of you have difficult marriages. I know that because I've talked to some of you. But I really know that because I'm married. Can we say, can we say above average difficult? <laughs> I got difficult marriages too. <laughs> so today, what we're going to talk about is the way that we are to evaluate our marriages. All right, so having said that, I want to remind you that staying, if you've been married for 60 years, it doesn't mean that you have a healthy marriage. Staying married is wonderful, but that is not how God measures healthy marriages. Having a bunch of kids, you can have a terrible marriage and have a bunch of kids. You can appear to have a healthy marriage and have a terrible marriage. You can be successful in every aspect of visible life and have an unhealthy marriage. And today what I want us to do is to look at these biblical ideas of submission and headship. And the reason I've chosen these is because this is the way that God has said that we are to measure our marriage. Our role as a spouse is to be measured in this way. <coughs> we're good. I love we're, it. we're downloading uh, to get it full screen. It's just slow. Um, let me tell you about me. I was going to have a picture of me up there. Maybe you saw it briefly. I have a picture. Uh, it's one of my favorite pictures. It's a picture of Mary Margaret and I 10 days after we met. Uh, we, had, we had been on one date maybe at that time. And... Just leave it like that. Ooh. We'll figure it. Um, that is 28 and a half years ago. 28 and a half years ago. We, uh, with, how long after this picture was taken did we had, had we decided we were going to marry? I mean, I'd already told somebody I was going to marry. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I very quickly started talking about marriage. And we were so naive. Not because we were foolish, but because we were 
not married. And, and I had no idea how all the decisions that I had made in my life were going to affect what we were about to, to do together. Um, I need you to know about me. And this, this is the truth about me, okay? You've heard me say in here a bunch of times, in my weakness, I, I just want you all to think that I'm great. Like, I, I, I think about sinfully often, how can, I, how can I present myself in a way that makes you think that there's something special about me? And that's a sin, and I do it. But here's the truth about me. In the 28 and a half years that have passed since then, I've made business decisions that cost us most of our savings and wealth and put us in a situation where 20 years ago we were on the verge of bankruptcy. I love you so much. <laughs> hey, Patrick, thank you. There have been three pronounced periods and many periods that were not as intense where I uh, sinned against my wife deeply using pornography. I became depressed, was diagnosed with depression five years ago about something like that. And there have been times, very real times in the last five years where I've been emotionally abusive to my wife. My wife and I have been in counseling in the last three months. I am not standing in front of you as the example of marriage. I'm standing in front of you telling you that I understand your marriage and I don't care how difficult it is. And the, my goal over the next six weeks is for us to understand marriage and ourselves in such a way that at the end of this six weeks, we can do things like identify things that we've done wrong, identify things that we brought into marriage because of the homes that we grow up in that, that hurt our spouse, to think about ways that we can worshipfully and in a God-honoring way encourage our spouse, lift, lifting up their spirits because they know they mess up, right? The, the six-week, uh, this is pretty close to in stone, but maybe not exactly in stone. Today is the theology of marriage. Next week is saying what needs to be said, this, uh, this, this reality that God, being a speaker, has given us words to communicate. The most important things that we'll do will require us communicating to our spouse. And there are things that we don't say that should be said. And there are things that we say that shouldn't be said. And I want to be better at, at not making those kinds of mistakes. Third week would be baggage. I mentioned some of them already. Some of you... Uh, some of you were not virgins when you married. Some of you had sex before you were married with your, with your current spouse. Some of you come from homes where you were taught the wrong way to think about marriage, and it was modeled for you painful and harmful ways to be married. And so when you got married, you just started everything thinking that this is what marriage was, and it wasn't. Some of you have, have uh, you brought into marriage bad spending habits, unhealthy friends, and, and, and that's the type baggage. All those things is, is what I want us to think through. The fourth, the fourth week is how, mar how marriage affects family, specifically parenting. Week five is sexual intimacy. And then week six will be a, a discussion about how do we take everything that we've talked about and take steps forward? Like what's a game plan to move forward and to do this thing that some of us are involved in called marriage in a way that brings more attention to the great thing that God intended it to be. So that is our path forward. Now, <clears throat> now I don't know what to do. What do I do? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to quit looking up and I'm going to look right here. What does the word Hallmark mean? Christmas movies. <laughs> All right. So it's branded. It's used in branding. So not only the movies, but in the cards, right, of course. I think they're the same. But anyway, uh, what does it mean outside of branding? Does anybody know? Like classic. Or like, like pillars. Uh, yeah. Like what? Like pillars. Pillars? A hallmark? Yeah. I like it. Standard. Standard. What would you say? Image. 
image. You, so where it's used, uh, memory, you know, like if I pick up a piece of sterling silver and I'm one, if I'm at the thrift store with my wife, not that she ever goes in thrift stores, all the time she goes in thrift stores and she finds amazing things. And if, if I were to see something that appeared to be sterling silver, but I wanted to know if it was plated or if it was real sterling, I would look on that piece somewhere for what's called a hallmark. You see them on pottery. You see them on, like I mentioned, on things that are, that are precious metals. But ultimately, a hallmark is something that proves that it's genuine. And I, I started by telling you that we're tempted to think that the hallmarks of marriage are longevity. Longevity in marriage is great. That's, I, I wish that for all of you, but that's not, biblically speaking, the hallmark of marriage. Healthy, successful children. I want it for all of you. I want it for my own kids. It's not the hallmark of marriage. The hallmarks of marriage in Scripture are headship and submission. It is the way that the Bible teaches that we are to evaluate our marriage to see if it is pure and genuine. So let me say again, you might be looking good, you might be feeling good, you might be, we're, we're probably not going to divorce. That may be what you're thinking. Our kids are on the right track and you can still have a marriage that is not genuinely God honoring. All right. When I think about what I want to be as a husband, and ladies, as you men, as you think that way, and as, as, as ladies, as you think about what you want to be as a wife, it is very easy, and we need to think this way, but it's very easy on one hand to say, I want to do these things. But I want you to see that for me to be the right kind of husband that honors God, I have to think not as what I am doing, it's what to what degree can I let this Jesus who has saved me act out in me? And that is true whether we're talking about headship or submission. And by the way, the only way that my, my wife as a husband and the only way wives your husband will be blessed the way that God intends marriage to bless is if it is in fact Jesus acting through you to your spouse. And we could continue this and I could add... Uh, I took the slides out, but I could add concentric circles to children and church and friends and community. And when we start getting those things out of order, we limit the blessings. We actually create harmful situations. But here's the passage. Here's the passage. And uh, it has been greatly misunderstood at me by times, uh, uh, by me at times, and it's been greatly mistaught, I'm afraid. Again, oftentimes by well-meaning people. This is Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. This is certainly not the only thing the Bible says about marriage, but this is the most complete description of how a husband and a wife are to interact with each other in, in a way that honors what God intends marriage to be. So here, let's read it together. Wives, so he's speaking to women, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Hmm. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might, the church might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as, they, as their own bodies. He, husband, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, going back to Genesis, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother 
and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, Paul says, is profound. And I'm saying that it, it, that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now this is, a, this is an illustration. Paul is using an illustration that we find in Scripture, this, this relationship between Jesus and the church, to inform us about what it would look like to have a healthy marriage. But there's a problem. Not in what Paul said, not in, what, not in the way that Christ loves his church. The problem is, is in, in this illustration, we see what's called an ideal. This is Paul saying, this is the ideal relationship that you should model your marriage after. The problem is, is that I'm not Jesus and I'm not fully sanctified. And both husbands and wives, as they act out, hoping to honor God in their roles in marriage, we already start with a sin nature. We already start deeply fragile, deeply broken at some level, and we, we come into marriage just prone to hurt each other and fail at this. So I, I want you to know that whether we're thinking about a husband, you, your role in modeling Christ, wife, your role in modeling the church, that this is an ideal. That this, is, this is not attainable in the sense that I cannot, like, I will never love my wife the way that Jesus loves me. I cannot do it. And because of that, there needs to be repentance. We'll talk about that next, we'll talk about that next week when we talk about communication. My wife can never submit to me the way that Christ's sanctified church submits to Him. So, this is super important but as a means of encouragement, I, I say very carefully, it's unattainable. And I want you to know that Jesus looks at your marriage with compassion, knowing your weakness, knowing your frailty, having lived on earth as a human being. And this is what we are to strive for. But I know this room is filled with marriages that have failed to get there. And this is not a reason for shame. It's a reason for hope. That... We have got a heavenly Father who sent a saving Son who is the picture, just like I don't get it right in any of my thinking about anything in my life. I don't get it all, all right. It's okay to, have, it's not okay in the sense that sin's okay, but like you're really normal if you haven't gotten it right. And you're really normal if you don't get it right tomorrow. But let's try, let's try to change the way we think about these things. Here's the passage that we're going to really... No! Here's the passage that we're really going to dig into. This, this, again, I'm going to read the first three verses. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Only ladies can answer. Why is that? Why does that just feel like? Ugh. Just that, tell the truth. Why does that just feel like? Mm. I think logistically it can be hard to see when women are the one that understand all the schedules, all the needs, all the things that are needed detail-wise to run a house. We are literally going to talk about that from Titus. Good job. <laughs> what else? Well, for one, it's been mistaught. And how, so I agree. How so? By making women feel like they are their husband's servants. Like, mm. you know. Yeah, but, and that is certain, uh, the opposite is true. The opposite is true. It's hard for us to submit to Jesus who's perfect because we're controlling much less somebody who is so not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting all husbands in the room. Meeting all husbands in the room. Anything else? <laughs> who is so broken? <laughs> she didn't mean that. She's a 
Any, hey, let's stop. Anything else on that? I think too because submit kind of sounds like sit back and do nothing. Whenever again we are controlling and we know and feel like we know what is the best way to do things, and submit sounds like but close your mouth and don't do anything. Oh y'all, <laughs> it's so easy to to like teach in this setting because y'all have teed it up perfectly for me. <laughs> Headship and submission, right? So we're going. So you can take notes or not, or throw it away. But I gave all of you a handout, and it is so hard, y'all. It is so hard to take four pieces of paper and put them in a copy machine and make them come out the right way and staple it. Good job. Headship and submission are misunderstood when they are imagined to have their origins in gender characteristics. Just think about that. By implication, when this has been... Now, the Bible does say things about gender characteristics, but they're almost always warnings. See, God in His perfect design has said that headship and submission are to be the hallmarks of marriage and we're to look at as our example Christ and His church, not what it's like to be a man and what it's like to be a woman. Do y'all know how much that has changed in time? And do you know how much it's going to change in time to be a man and a woman? Just in our in the last hundred years, depending on where you are in the world. This could I mean if, if you think headship and submission is born out of what it means to a man in Saudi Arabia or a man in the United States or a, a woman who has who has been trained by uh, her culture to be a sinfully, uh, not all feminism is sinful, of course, but like that we can go too far and masculinity can go too far. It can't be what we feel like as a man, what we think it means to a man. If we let culture or anything for that matter but scripture inform what it means to be a man and a woman, we will misunderstand this passage. This is so encouraging, ladies, on this issue of submission. Paul, same writer, 1 Corinthians, talking about the relationship between a husband and a wife, says this, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. And by the way, this is, this is a, a, new, a general neutral, neutral word. And the head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Think back to when we studied Luke and you have this submissive Jesus. We talked about it at Advent. Born in a manger. Giving up so much of what was rightfully His to live among people like me. And He did that beautifully submitting to the will of His Father. And so my point in in pointing this out is, is that both headship and submission. Ladies, if you're tempted to think that submission is a second-hand role, Please remember that Jesus modeled gloriously submission. Whatever submission means, Christ was willing to do it perfectly and didn't give up one bit of His glory. And that's Paul, right? I'm not just saying like anecdotally speaking. I'm telling you that Scripture makes this point. <clears throat> so, we need to define this stuff. Now, listen to me. This is a combination of I don't know how many different definitions that you could read. This is my best stab at it so so as not to plagiarize. Headship is important phrases. I, I, I wanted to choose these words carefully. Headship is God's calling of a husband to be Christ-like And Christ led to do all that he can to see his wife experience God's goodness and graciousness in every aspect of her life. So first of all, my calling to be the head of my house is not because I'm a man. It's because God has called me to do this. It is not born out of my masculinity. God has equipped me 
but he has not made me in and of myself able to be the head of my home. Secondly, everything that I'm to do is to be Christ-like and Christ-led. The moment that I do anything in headship or in wanting to be the head of my home, the moment I do anything outside of God's will and instruction, I'm not being the head of my home. We'll talk about that more. And the focus, as we saw, in the same way that Christ gave everything that he gave to sanctify his church out of a love for it, the church, that's you and I, all of us in the room that are Christians. My role as headship originates in God's calling and the focus and the blessing of it is primarily on my wife. So I say again, whatever I do, claiming to be the head of my home, that is self-focused, prideful, self-promoting, it's not headship. Headship is to be evaluated in where do I feel it originates and what is its aim. And it's my wife. And it is misunderstood, ladies and gentlemen, if I believe that headship is the deserved or logical hierarchy born from the superiorities of the male gender or the inferior, inferiorities of the female gender. And this, I think, is where most of the bad teaching comes from. The Bible has a lot to say about how God has specifically made it possible for me to be the head of my home. And I think gender issues are important. But I can be, in many ways, a man and not be the head of my home. We look to Christ. So what is submission? Submission is a wife's divine calling. Again, God's, I could have said God's, what, submission is God's calling to respond faithfully to God's leadership of and God's leadership through her husband as she seeks God's goodness and graciousness in every area of her life. Now this is really important. When I as a husband am not led by God, and I, when I as a husband am not acting through God's leadership, my wife, I put my wife in a very difficult situation because there are times when she needs to say to me and in a God-honoring way has to say to me, Tim, I think you're wrong. And so the qualifier here is that my wife is in beautiful submission to me when she is responding to God's leadership in me. Submission is not, and we'll talk about all that, but one thing it's not is sinning at the urging of your husband or watching your husband sin. And again, same idea. Ladies, you are not called to submit because there's something inferior about you. You are not called to submit because that is the way that you were, like, like that, that's, that you couldn't lead in any way. That's not, of course, what it means. What they're not. Biblical headship. Here's the bad teaching. Unilateral authority. What does that mean? What does unilateral mean? One side. So, so I mean this. When a husband and wife, when marriage is working beautifully, and there's a disagreement about something that's not a sin. So this isn't a, this isn't a righteousness issue. It's just a decision to be made. The husband ultimately is responsible for making the call. But did you know that there are a lot of times in my marriage where I lead my family in a way in a moment that's not healthy and my wife needs to say to me, Tim, stop. She does it respectfully because she's my friend. But it is not unilateral authority. It is not as a husband that my wife is to do everything I tell her to do. That cannot be what it means. It is not a right or a license to force my wife to submit. There is not one scripture, you will not point to a scripture. Have at it, get after it, try to find it. That says that I have the right to force my wife to submit to me. My attention is to be on 
my faithfulness to be ahead, not the degree to which my wife submits to me. The measure is not, like, I don't look to my wife to see how I'm doing as a husband. It is not a positioning by God to act as or be God for my wife. I, listen, again, I feel like I'm saying well intended a lot. A lot of well intending people, and I'll, I'll use this phrase qualified in just a moment, but a lot of well intending people try to equate being a husband with being a pastor. And there are aspects, there are pastoral things that husbands do, but, but a pastor in Scripture is an office in the church where there is a vested authority. That is not what headship is. It's, it's not, I am not God's spoke, spokesman to my wife. She is not to get her spiritual nourishment from me. So on those lines, Submission is not trusting supremely in your husband. Ladies, submission is not waking up imagining that you need, I use that word carefully, need your husband to be blessed by God. There is a sense for sure in which they're like the most God-honoring blessings if you're married come through this, this play, this beautiful interrelation of headship and submission. But my my wife can't trust me all the time. She shouldn't trust me all the time. It's not avoiding effort to see change in your husband. Right? This, I, think, I think like when, when my parents described their parents' marriages, you see what I'm saying? When my parents described their, my grandparents' marriages, I feel like in both of them it was taboo. It was very, very volatile if my grandmothers tried to say to my grandfathers John or Homer Homer John or Homer I think you're wrong I think that you could do this better listen I need my wife to be saying I need my wife to help me be sanctified that's how I want to say that I need my wife to help me be sanctified I need her to respectfully say Tim Let's think about you for a second. Oh, I've already said this. It doesn't mean that you receive your spiritual nourishment from your husband. Can't mean that. That would be bad. And it doesn't mean, oh, I don't know what your marriage is like, and I don't know what you watched growing up, but if your mother or if you are afraid of your husband, it's not headship and submission. And I confess to you that there have been times, especially emotionally, that my wife has been afraid of me. Where if she made a mistake, she could rightly predict that I would harm her emotionally. And that's not headship. It's not submission either. Can we move on um, on the unilateral um, authority piece? Um, there's a woman that studies a lot of Old Testament um, law and how it pertains to women. Her name is Dr. Katie McCoy. Say it again. Dr. Katie McCoy. Katie McCoy. And um, she writes about um, how we misunderstand the culture in the Old Testament because our current uh, evangelical culture is largely informed by Hellenistic things, um, Greek philosophers and things like that. Whether we like it or not, that's what we see the world as, which promoted men in an area that was quite different than the Hebrew culture did. And so this is written to people, the laws are written to people that had a completely different view of the household and how it ran. And on the uh, idea of unilateral authority, that would have never been such in Hebrew, Hebrew culture because of the way they ran their household. It would have been almost, it would have been like a bad look. Um, but culturally here, it's kind of like, we raise men really high. Not that we shouldn't. Uh, I'm not trying to say what we should and shouldn't do. Just she speaks a lot, and she speaks from a place I think of um, a lot of education about how we misunderstand that. So culture. you would commend any Dr. of us to go read Dr. Katie, Katie McCoy. McCoy. And if you want just a snippet of her beliefs before you like jump in and read her books, if you don't have time, um, Knowing Faith is a podcast that I listen to a lot. Uh, I say a lot when I'm listening to podcasts. They're on my list. Uh, Men and Women in a Broken World with Katie McCoy. 
and she is interviewed by them and she kind of introduces this idea and it's not a, a huge investment of your time and mine. Thank you. Remind me never to go back. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Church like. This is the phrase that I've chosen. Church like. Okay? In the ideal analogy that Paul uses, the beautiful, perfect, ideal analogy of the relationship between Christ and his church, ladies, in submission, when you look at a marriage or consider marriage or look back at a marriage, or, or if you're evaluating your parents' marriage or your kids' marriage. Here's the role of the woman. God's beautiful design is that she's to be a well-suited helper. I'll be back in a little bit. This is from Genesis, of course. And, and we talked about this very recently as we studied Genesis. Genesis 2.18 is this. Then the Lord God said, and so this is God for our benefit, communicating why he did what he did when it came to making a woman. And it, it, he did it because, and here's God informing us, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. We talked about this when we, the problem was the man needed help. Ladies, your creation was in a response to my, not mine, to to the weakness of man. It, it was not that man couldn't do it by himself. He, he could not. I think I just said that the wrong way. Man could not honor God fully by himself. He was weak in that he needed a helper. So this idea, like when you read Genesis or think about headship and submission or look at verses about being a helpmate, it's not that you're Man is like giving you a little role in the ways. So like, let me let you let me let you justify your existence. Now, you exist because I need help. But Mary Margaret exists because because I need help. <clears throat> Here, as an encourager, I'll read First Peter three one through four. Likewise, that's just a transition. There's not a um, likewise. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, things like the braiding of your hair and putting on gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. <clears throat> um, this is not a passage about how women are to behave in every area of their life. This is Peter saying very specifically that in a marriage where you have a lost husband or a sinning husband, I think it's safe to say, that the way that you relate to him can very often be a way that God causes him to consider his stance spiritually. And God says that that is precious. So when I sin against my wife and she lovingly and respectfully responds to me, that is precious to God. And you can, you can interrupt me and comment at any time. A skilled worker. Now, I'm not going to read the entirety of Proverbs 31, but as we, as we will see in Titus in just a moment, I believe with all my heart that my wife is to, in a very real sense, run our home. She's better at it. She's good at it. And, and she has great authority in our home. And husbands... Your wife should have great authority in your home to make decisions. I would, I dare not even start naming them. But you need to let your wife lead the home in many ways. An enthusiastic lover, this is week five, pursuing him and delighting in him. 
We'll get what that's week five. And here it is in Titus, a household overseer. Listen to this passage. Older women, and by the way, that does not mean 80-year-olds. That just means it probably it probably just means that are women that are mature, women that are uh, established and, and can be trusted. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young or the immature women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Don't pass over that last phrase, so that the word of God may not be reviled. Listen, when you get marriage and headship wrong, it makes people revile the word of God. And I don't want any part, you, we don't want any part of that. But you see here, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it to point to. This idea of working at home does not mean that you can't work outside the home. It is not that the only place you are to work is the home. It is completely possible for headship and submission to honor God and a wife to have a job outside the home. But it does mean that you can't ignore your house. It does mean that as, a, as the role of a wife, and in this case as a mother, it means that your efforts, there's a priority on the health of your home in which you should have great authority. Any comments about this church likeness? Husbands, Christ likeness. I'm to be a sacrificial lover that is not sexual. We saw this. And I any good teaching on this has to include pointing to this verse that we've already read in Ephesians that says that I'm supposed to love Mary Margaret ideally like Christ loved the church. There could be no higher bar. First and foremost, Am I loving my wife the way Christ loved the church? And to that, we can add that she is not my servant. I am her servant. I said that out loud. Christ, He came to serve us. His whole atoning life was unnecessary. It, It did nothing to accomplish His righteousness. It was to accomplish our righteousness. Christ's life. Here it is from Matthew. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, Christ's followers. But whoever would be great among you must be a servant. Great husbands are servants. And whoever would be first among you will be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. Christ's likeness means, headship means, we take the role of a servant. That is so different than the way I've heard headship, what it means to be the head of a home. A family shepherd. Now I'm going to read from First Timothy. This is um, this is this is Paul saying to Timothy, when you're choosing leaders in the church, choose these type of men. Okay. And one of the things that he says is that, and I won't read the whole thing. I'm to be as all of us as men. Every man in this room needs to have these. I want you to have these quali- these characteristics. Above reproach. That means that nobody can, like, there's not even a hint of accusation that could be made against me. The husband of one wife, sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own house well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone, Paul says, if someone does not know how to manage his household, how in the world will he, my my emphasis, how will he care for God's church? And notice the things he said. Like, let this inform men what you think headship is. 
gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, not measuring your success as a man based on wealth. Hmm. A tender knower. Now, this I, I'm on. I'm gonna say this is the most misunderstood or most difficult to understand, maybe verse in the Bible about the relationship in marriage. Here it is, First Peter. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Weaker vessel. There, I believe means I, I can think of two things that are in keeping with the rest of scripture that it could mean one is that in reality for most of us our wives are physically weaker that is that in the way that I communicate with her in my body language and my strength it, I, I, I would never want to do that I would never want to let those run wild I would never want to be unmeek with those because it would harm my wife the other thing is that in a Christian marriage, your wife will be tempted, I think, to... Here, here is, is Peter saying to the church, you know what marriage is supposed to look like. Would you please kindly realize that your wife, it's easy for her to imagine that she has a lesser role. Don't do anything in this marriage situation to make her feel weaker because she is the wife. Maybe the Holy Spirit was saying through Peter's writings, men, you're going to be tempted to take what you want headship to be and lord it over your wife. Don't do that. It cannot mean, it does not mean, and I'll fight with anybody who claims that it means that my wife is weaker emotionally than me. My wife is strong. My wife is stronger than me emotionally. She has a healthier uh, understanding of her own emotions and how to communicate them than I do. She does. It does not mean that she is less intelligent than me. Maybe you've heard the story. I, my wife and I. This is great. My wife and I had a disagreement about uh, which of us would have the higher IQ. I made the mistake of reaching out to my high school counselor that's right and she went back and got my IQ test from high school and my wife's IQ is more than mine <laughs> my point but, but I, I, I say I say that because whatever weakness means here it cannot mean of less value or of less character or of less means because he finishes it by saying because we are equal heirs like, we are equal in so, 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 so many ways. If not, I'm lesser than she is. Like, there are lots of ways where she's more than I am. And finally, a willing provider. The idea is that, men, if you're not willing to work, if there, need, if, if, if there is a shortage of resources such that your family is threatened by unhealthy circumstances, it is horrid to refuse to work you must be willing to provide when provision is needed you have to be so much so that paul says to timothy but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever what that says my paraphrase what that is is, is completely unchristian it doesn't make any sense to, for someone to say, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to let the people who I'm supposed to love the most suffer because of my laziness. All right. <clears throat> We're done. Before I close this, does anybody want to say anything? Doug? At the risk of being the one that comments, right, as everyone tries to get their kids. Um, <laughs> some, something that you said or a bullet you had up there was, you know, what it is not is serving as the pastor to your wife or being the one solely responsible, I'm adding a little, for spiritual nourishment. Right. We have a natural tension for sure where Elaine's desire is, hey, lead Bible studies for the boys. Um, yeah, that's me. I got you. Et cetera. So I wrote a reflection question for myself, but it's how do I lead my family so they may know and love God 
and glorify him and have a heart for making disciples. So, like, we listen to Paige Brown together every week. We do a Bible study fellowship at different places, but we do the reflection questions together every week. And then we have a Bible study with our boys. And my question is always, like, when's enough enough? But it's it's helpful for me to think of not pastoring, but leading. How do I lead them and know their hearts so that what God has gifted them with is where they're growing to love God better, et cetera. And then the natural tension is with Elaine. Are we actually leading together, or is it a balance that goes towards the unhealthy part? Mm. And, I, and that's uh, very uh, thought-provoking for me, especially in, in the circumstance of our marriage. And here's why. It is completely possible to have a God-honoring marriage and for the wife to be more spiritually mature than the husband. And it's this simple. Let's suppose that you get married and you become a Christian. At, let's suppose, and it could have happened in this room. Let's suppose you became a believer after you were married, but your wife had been a believer for some time. This is not this. All this headship stuff is not a measure of who knows the most theology and who knows the most. Like we should all desire in ways that honor God to learn more of His Scripture and to do all those things. To Doug's point, going back to what we we defined headship as: to what degree am I giving myself to see my wife grow in every part of her life? Sexual. I mean, to be protected emotionally, financially, sexually spiritually right it's not it, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my wife to Jesus if you will and I don't want to do anything to stand in that in, in the way and the wife should be longing to get to Jesus and encouraging her husband help me get there I love it when you help me get there anything else on that all right here's what I want you to do together and I want you to do it I'm not going to ask you if you did it next week but I want you to do it. I want you to pray together. And here's what I want you to say. Husbands, I want you to acknowledge to your wife that you've made mistakes guarding her well-being. In the way that you viewed your... I mean, there's all, I, we don't have time. Here are some examples of what in my marriage have been things that I need to repent of. Harshness. It's the opposite of gentle. Harshness. Selfishness. I'm not looking to my wife's needs. I'm looking to what I want. Right? That's a sin. And unilateralism. Man, there have been times where, where Mary Margaret knew better spiritually and I chose something because I was the man. And those are gross things. Talk to your wife and be specific. Tell her the truth. Trust her. Trust God in her. And ask your wife to forgive you. Ladies, acknowledge to your husband that you've made mistakes respecting and submitting to his responsibility to lead. Ladies, you can act in a way that discourages your husband. It makes it harder for him to lead. Now, this is not, for sure I'm harsh and selfish and unilateral sometimes. My wife is not often disrespectful. Um, so th don't think about my wife. You can think about me on the bad stuff. Don't think about my wife on the bad stuff. <laughs> Wives, acknowledge to your husband that you've made mistakes respecting and submitting to his responsibility to lead. Disrespectfulness, failure to encourage, and nagging are common failures. And tell him that you, like be specific. Say, I know I do this. And trust him in that moment. Be specific and ask your husband to forgive you. So you're going to pray together. And the, the, the thought of the prayer will be something like this for wives. God, make me more submissive in a way that honors you, that honors Christ. And husbands, God, make me the sacrificial head of my home in the way that Christ is the head of His church. Next week, we'll talk about communication. Today is the most important. Like, I'm careful in saying it, but like, I know this wasn't fun. Like, I'm telling you, we'll laugh more next week. But what we do next week is not, it's, it's much less important than this because what we talked about today will inform everything else that we talk about. I cannot.
be my wife's sexual partner if I don't understand what we talked about today. I cannot be my wife's... uh, I can't guard her against sin. I can't encourage her to be faithful. I can't... It's just a long list of things that I can try to do, but if I veer away from this idea of headship and Christ serving the church... I get it wrong. So this is the most, everything else we talk about will be informed by what we talked about today. Okay? Let's pray. Father, forgive us for being late. Uh, Father, um, in, for those in the room who choose to sit down with their spouse and have this time of sharing and repentance, God, please make these marriages mature. And make it possible for these confessions and for these times of asking for forgiveness to be sweet. God, guard husbands and wives alike from being condemning or shaming. But Father, instead, please, in the way that Christ loves us, help everything that is said in response to repentance to be encouraging and to give hope. Amen.